tour is sponsored by Greensboro, Glover, and, and the Crossbury Energy Committee. Um, Amelia Fritz is our chair of the Energy Committee, and always looking for new members if anybody else wants to join us. Uh, and uh, there's a new committee in Albany, too, so if people are interested uh, in joining that, you're welcome to. I can give you the contact info. Um, and we help other people, other towns, get started uh, with energy committees. Paul yeah. over here is from Sutton. They're starting their energy committee up, and a lot of great things can happen from there. You guys are a real leading light. <laughs> well, thanks. Yeah, it's really important stuff, I think, that uh, happens with uh, what we're all doing. Um, so yeah, a uh, great tour this morning with Matt Moody, uh, a local builder, and uh, he'll talk about his 2,600 square foot house that he built for the fountains. Yeah. Um, and uh, at the end, I'd like to also put in a plug for one of our energy committee uh, projects that we have going on is these window inserts. Uh, and there's a sign up sheet here that you can put your name and email down to uh, get on the list for uh, presentations, but also uh, if you're interested in the window inserts, we'll talk about that more later on. So uh, Matt is here along with Tomas. Yeah. Tomas is back here, Tomas Cohen and his wife and child. Uh, they helped build the house also. Uh, and the little guy helped too, I think, right? <laughs> I see him sweeping the floor. That's this right. right. <laughs> so, uh, with no further ado, Matt, do you want to? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Have you. Questions too. Yeah, thank you for coming. Um, this house was started about a little about a year ago and a little bit longer than that when you consider the, the planning and stuff. Um, Jim and Gwen Fountain are, uh, they live in Philadelphia and then they spend the winter in Florida. And so this house is as a result of um, their granddaughter next door. They really wanted to be next to their granddaughter and so they decided to build a house here. At first it was gonna be a very small cabin <laughs> and uh, as they got to thinking about it and they'd come up and spend time with their granddaughter and their daughter and son-in-law, they decided that they would like to live here at least half the time. And so the project got a lot bigger than we had originally planned and, and here it is. So um, we're about to finish it up. We've got you know, a few things with the electrical system and uh, uh, a few bits to finish up, but it's pretty close to being completed. And then of course they'll do some landscaping and, and we'll put in some stairs for the outside porches and stuff next over the summer probably. Yes. So some of the interesting features about this house were um, it was it was originally going to be a, ba a basic house and so it would have been two by six construction and uh, pretty normal in far, as far as energy standards go and when they dis when they started to think about how much time they were going to spend here and how much investment they were going to make they started to, to make decisions that led towards more energy efficiency. So if you've been on some of the other energy tours, uh, those houses are very high performance homes and super tight and pretty amazing builds. And this one is more, um, it comes from a starting point of being a normal home and heading that direction. So some decisions were made during the process to uh, make the walls thicker, to give it more insulating value, uh, continuous insulation on the outside, um, we decided to do a, a different system for the roof so that I could create a really super defined and super tight air barrier. Uh, the house tried as an experiment, we tried a product called Aero Barrier, which is a, an, an air sealing method that um, you can use for construction that's more normal. Um, usually if you really want a super tight house, the traditional approach is to put the house together really carefully and have highly skilled workers uh, taping all the joints with really expensive tapes and um, trying to to get down to the very every last leak um, in this house we did a lot of that on this on the main part but then uh, when we realized that we were going to try this new product and new system we decided to leave the uh, entryway more as a normal construction and then see what we could achieve with the system and uh, so we can talk about aero barrier in a few minutes here. And so the house actually got down to to be one of the tightest houses in Vermont. And um, 
and it, it's it's kind of a neat system because it shows that you can get to a very tight house using conventional more conventional construction methods if you d if you decided to uh, anything we should add so what are the are the walls still two by six they're they're two by eight actually two by eight. yeah so the walls got upgraded to two by eight um, and part that was that was an easy change to make without really changing the way we would have built it um, on the outside we have a zip bar sheathing which is like a it's a the green sheathing that you see everywhere but uh, the difference is zip bar has a foam insulation on the inside of the of the sheathing panel that's laminated to it so when you nail it to the house and then tape the joints it creates a very tight um, continuous insulation all over the entire structure so that all of your studs and if you have headers or any any of the structure isn't bleeding heat through the wood because wood is an insulator but not that great um yeah i'm interested to know more about the foam um the and what it's made of and the off gassing and that sort of okay thing. um that's something i'm not sure i could tell you a lot about um the foam that they use in the zip bar panels are uh, polyisocyanurate it's a foam uh in this case it has like a, a a coating on the inside surface that's like um, I would almost say like a paper coating and then on the and then it's laminated to basically OSB on the outside um, no no this is this is a sheet foam so uh, it's I don't have a sample of it oh I do have a piece of polyisocyanurate in the in the garage it's a foil, when you think of foil faced foam if you go to the lumber yard and pick up uh, or look at foil faced foam that's that's essentially what's on the outside of the studs of the of the walls of this house oh, what's the spray stuff? Uh, she's talking about uh, sp spray foam insulation no. oh the air okay so so air barrier is the air sealing method that they used in this house and what that does is the um, you bring in uh, the insulator has a has a truck set up and he will bring it bring his truck in he brings a an acrylic caulking type compound that's in a buckets five gallon buckets and then he has a system where they bring all these little hoses in to each area then they'll set up these um, aerosol spray heads in each area of the, like there might be one in the bedroom a couple in this room because it's larger a few downstairs and so these hoses all come from the garage and go snake all the way down to these different spraying heads and then they put in a blower door uh, at the doorway and they pressurize the house and they spray in an aerosolized caulking compound and what happens is as the as the house is leaking because it's been pressurized more than the outside uh, the caulking compound will catch on the edges of all the gaps and cracks and as more and more of it catches and hits itself it starts to build up and it'll it'll clog up an, a hole supposedly as far as a as wide as a half an inch in diameter so um, it can go, if it, but the main thing it does is really well is it seals up all the little tiny cracks. And that's something that pe builders have chased for years when they're trying to make houses really tight. So it gives the builder a way to seal up a house and, and sort of a guaranteed way to, to get to a certain level of tightness. So in this house, um, before the whole process started, they did the blower door test and, and it measured about 0.8. Um, and that's that's air changes per hour at 50 pascals which is the amount of pressure 50 pascals is actually a very small amount of pressure um, but it's it's uh, it's as if the wind would be blowing outside and you're and you you see your windows maybe move when you're in an older house um, so then what happens is the aerosol is sprayed in and as they spray this the spray it, the gaps start to fill up and they're pressurizing the house continuously and then they'll they'll chart it on a computer graph uh, to see how far down they get to and they, it went from 0.8 which is a, I think um, efficiency Vermont has a has a one air change an hour is like a high considered a high performance build and 0.8 was pretty good uh, passive house would be 0.6 I think and then this house got down to 0 0.08 and which is like kind of off the charts for air tightness these days I think unless you're in Germany maybe yeah. is there any like a lifetime sense of what the clock does I mean I yeah. clock everything when I do but you know 10 years later it's cracked and stuff yeah it's something that I definitely think about um, 
I can't answer that question. Uh, they, the company that developed it has done some longer, longer range testing and supposedly they have very little drop from the performance over, over their testing period, which I can't remember. I had some literature on that. Um, they did a 50 year testing simulation and maintained 99.87% of their value, but it, you know, I don't know if this is hocus pocus or not. It was a test. It, it was really interesting. I'm kind of a guy that's not so much interested in spraying a caulking compound into my house. So, you know, so it's something to think about. The material is supposedly, uh, it's a, they call it, it has a UL green gold certification, which is supposedly you can use it in healthcare facilities and around children. And, and when you look at the substance itself, it's basically like acrylic caulk that you would buy at the hardware store. And once it dries, it's, it's basically an inert substance as a, as a dried product. While they're spraying it in here, of course, it's, it's like as thick, it's such a thick cloud, I couldn't see you guys across the room. The entire place is just a full white cloud. And then you paint backwards, do you sand it? No, it's, uh, it actually will settle as it, um, when they stop put, spraying it, the, they open all the doors and windows and exhaust whatever's left in the air. Anything that uh, is in the space will start to settle, and so it actually made the floor sticky. <laughs> and so when we set up to do the thing, the windows all have to be in, so any, any window ledge or uh, even these little facets on the doors all had to be covered with something to keep the, st the sticky material from settling on, this, on horizontal surfaces. But all the walls and the roof, because we were worried about the ceiling getting this stuff all over it and being sticky and it, it didn't do anything like that at all. So you actually did this after your sheetrock? Yeah. No, this is uh, before the insulation went in. So the, the house had the, all the windows were in. It's basically, a, uh, a, it's framed and sheathed and, and a tight assembly. And then they, they did it at that point. So all the sheathing was in and uh, the insulation went in after this. But this system can be installed in any house at any, any time. You, it's best to do it at the beginning of the construction, but you can do it after the sheetrock's on. Okay. You can do it in a house that's already been built, but you would of course have to, if you had carpeting everywhere, you'd have to cover it, you know? And so, no, you wouldn't have to repaint. It's because it, it doesn't it doesn't adhere to the the actual flat surfaces. Right. It's it's only it's movement through the cracks and gaps that cause it to stick to stuff. Yeah. So the house is pressurized. Yeah. And you're spraying this compound, and it is finding all the, and it's forcing it out, and it catches in the the cracks and yeah. the, the open places and it fills them in while the house is pressurized. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then you can somehow measure that pressurization so it changes and you can see it change and you know that the house is sealed once that's happened. Exactly, yeah. So the, as they're sealing it, the process took, this was like the first one that, that uh, Murphy Celtec was the insulator and this is the first one that he did. Um, it took them a little over well, it took, it took them about a day to do the whole process because it was their first one. But generally they can do almost two houses a day if they, uh, in a new construction like this where they're not trying to cover the entire carpet and stuff like that. But yeah, they can do, it takes about four hours to do the process. And in this case, they came the day before and they did some prep work and they started and then they had some a little trouble and so they went home and then they came back the next morning and, and did the whole process without some of the glitches that they were having right at first. So we were a kind of a test case. <laughs> um, the, the th another interesting thing I should mention about Aero Barrier is that it's from a product called Aero Seal and it all was developed with, because uh, people put in ductwork in buildings all the time and ductwork is always transporting tons of air, air conditioned air, heated air, fresh air, and all that ductwork ends up leaking a lot because it's got lots of joints at every elbow and everything. And, and so contractors that were trying to install those sorts of things were getting fed up with the fact that the detailing that you have to do in order to make ductwork really seal up is um, tricky. You know, it's all these joints that are sometimes up and difficult to get two spaces. So somebody came up with the idea to aerosolize something in the ductwork and and get the gaps and cracks that way. 
And so by uh, doing that, somebody finally came up with the idea, wow, we could probably do this to a whole house, you know. And so they started to develop the system, and that's where it came from. And uh, it's, it turned out really good, but I can't really tell you how long, you know, what the result is, because I kind of wonder the same thing. Um, you suggested that you had some drawbacks with it personally? With the arrow barrier? Like maybe on your own house, you think twice? Mostly, mostly because... Um, I know how to seal a house up the conventional way by using tapes and, and that sort of method, like some of the other home tours that we were at. Um, so that's, a, that's something that I can do myself. This is something where I'd have to call and bring somebody in to do. And personally, I, I usually do a lot of my own work for my own house. And then I also have problems with the idea of like, how long is this going to last? I even wonder about tapes. You know, tape, tape sticks to stuff for a while and then it starts to dry out. So how long are these tapes going to last? I don't know. So that's the kind of reservations I have about any of these systems that we're trying. So, yeah. It's curious that it doesn't stick to anything but horizontal surfaces. But yeah. uh, you didn't have any problem with staining? No, not at all. I mean, I was really nervous about it because I had to stain every board in the ceiling, you know. Yeah. And, and so... I was nervous that the uh, the process might cause a mess, but it didn't at all. It was, I mean, the floor, the subfloor was all sticky, and that was a little bit aggravating because it's hard to sweep a sticky floor. But it was okay. She's looking at a cobweb up there. <laughs> yeah, there's a cobweb up there. That's not arrow arrow barrier. It's a <laughs> anyway. So, yeah. The concept of the net zero uh, houses that the Department of Energy has and whether you had that in mind at all when you decided on the R values for the, no. the ceiling? No. On this particular house, um, it was more conventional structure that headed towards a more efficient structure. So they, we didn't, other than efficiency Vermont uh, standards that we were trying to reach, we, we didn't really give it much thought to trying to make it net zero or anything like that. Um, one thing that you'll notice is that other house over there has uh, like an 8,000 watt solar array and originally the this house because they're re related they were going to tie the electrical systems together and maybe use you know piggyback off the solar array from next door and it, it became apparent that their house actually they they use most of their solar over the year so that they're I don't know if they're net zero or not but they um, they actually use most of that and there wouldn't have been a much of a credit left over for this place, and so they decided to separate their electrical system. You could, you could do a, yeah. a solar array here with a battery and come to net zero without much trouble, I wouldn't think. I don't know. I, um, I haven't really thought much about it other than just trying to get the house built. <laughs> so, yeah. This is uh, Jim Severett from Efficiency Vermont in the Red Jacket. Uh, maybe she could answer some questions like that. Any other questions? Hey. I'm, I'm sorry, I missed what your question was. It was how easy it would be to uh, supplement this uh, to get it with, so, with uh, solar so you can net zero. Sure. So the Efficiency Vermont program has two tiers. And the base program is designed to uh, get a house to a level where it would be relatively easy to put a normal sized um, PV system on the house to get to net zero. Um, that's the intention. We call it net zero ready, basically. Right. Um, okay, concept. Yeah, and then uh, the other tier is more for folks looking for passive house mm -hmm. standards, but don't want to go with the passive house certification. They can shoot for our higher level and come close to passive house with all the certification. Yeah. Have, you, have you done any uh, energy modeling with this house as far as how much uh, BTU, how many BTUs it will no, take? No, we've done a preliminary. No. I don't think we did a preliminary one this time because the plans kept changing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we were t so. we kept chasing like a, a higher standard yeah. little by little, so it was kind of hard to pin down what, right. what was going to be the final result. But there will be one since we started. Yeah. We were supposed to do a blower door test today at the end of this. And I couldn't get the wood stove early enough, so there's the the hole. <laughs> so, the, so the fans in the bathrooms contribute to the 
ventilation system, so you've got it yeah. tied together. So uh, that kind of leads us to the ventilation system for this house. This has an HRV uh, energy heat, re re uh, heat recovery ventilator, and that's down in the basement, and then there's several ducts in different parts of the house um, that pull air, like you pull air from the kitchen and the bathroom, and, the, and then you supply fresh air to the bedroom, and there's a little vent right over here by Dan that's, that's supplying fresh air to all the different areas of the house. So that's one, one type of ventilation, and that, that one uses a heat exchanger where the air doesn't touch the other air as it passes out to the outside, but it transfers some of the energy through a heat exchanger. And then the other thing is, um, this house has bathroom fans in each bathroom, and they, uh, they're, they'll depressurize the house a little bit as you turn, turn them on, but, and you always have to make a decision about whether the bathroom fan is even needed or not. Um, the guy that installed the, David Hansen installed the heat recovery ventilator and he said in, in his experience probably in this, in this upstairs bathroom that's so close to the actual heat recovery ventilator he probably wouldn't put a bathroom fan in. But he said it's safe to put one in because if they want one and they need it it's a lot easier to have it in there now than it is to right. add one later. So um, I think in a lot of cases you can get away without it. Yeah. Uh, not install it. It's, yeah. it's all about how fast folks want their mirrors to, to clear up. Right. I mean, it really is what, what drives people, you know, is yeah. um, whether or not they put a bathroom fan in, how fast they want the mirror to clear So they might not even use the bathroom fan. It might be just, it was just fine, but it's there in case they need it. Um, we did not use a, an external uh, vented stove vent. So this is just going to be a recirculating type ventilation. And the house over there is the same way, uh, mostly because this is an all electric house. So there's no, they're not burning uh, 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 propane to cook their dinner and stuff like that. So the decision was made not to have a, an outside air vent. Um, I, I want to put in a plug for Efficiency Vermont. Good. After our home tour in Greensboro, Greensboro Bend, uh, I was filled with questions about things like ventilation fans and that kind of thing. And I, I called Efficiency Vermont and I got a super helpful, I don't remember her name, super helpful, um, answered most of my questions and, and even the ones that I didn't even know I wanted to ask. Mm -hmm. And I would just highly recommend everybody, uh, if you have these kind of questions after a tour like this, Efficiency Vermont seems like a super resource to use. And we kind of left it that I've got her like personal desk phone and I'm going to call her back when, when I understand what questions I want to ask. So. Yeah. Um, let's see, probably another feature we should mention about the house before we forget uh, and get too far into other things is uh, one of the things that I, I love to do timber framing and that's one of my favorite types of work to do. And so this is, this is a heavy timber structure, but I wouldn't call it timber framing um, overhead here. It's, a, it's bolted together, but one of the problems with timber framing is uh, oftentimes people want to have the structure like this, but they also want that structure to go outside and create the overhangs because it kind of makes sense. Um, that's always been a problem with timber frames because every one of those timbers is a piece of wood that moves and ex expands and contracts and it shrinks, especially after you, if you cut wood green like I do a lot of times and so every one of those spots is an opportunity for an air leak especially if that arrow barrier didn't stretch far enough as the timber shrunk you know I'm not sure that it would survive that because some things shrink a lot um, so in this house we created a roof system that, that that's continuously wrapped and it doesn't have any of the structure inside sticking out through the air barrier so it's all uh, the way it was framed was we have the walls then the heavy rafters sit on top of the walls and then the insulation or the or the boards or board sheathing is on what you see there and then there's a we wrapped the top with the gray sice and water shield which is a really thicky uh, sticky um, sheet good that people use on roofs and it glues itself together like it's like three foot wide sheets of duct tape and it makes a good, uh, good barrier because it, when you drive nails and screws through it for the roofing surf, uh, materials, it actually seals around the nails and screws really well. Um, and that laps down over onto the zip sheathing 
which is, uh, makes a really good contact with that. And then over that we used, uh, you want to get a piece of foam there? We used 12 inches of this expanded polystyrene. Um, this is, yeah, this is what's on the roof. Yeah, so we used two layers of this with the joints staggered. And then the way that we created the overhangs was, this is pretty rigid stuff. And then it, uh, we, we strapped it. So we put two by material on the, on the roof that's over each rafter and in between. And it sticks down and hangs out over the roof and creates the two foot overhangs. And so, and then we sheathed over that like you would normally. And then the, the roofer was able to have a surface to put his materials on. And that, that way we created a really tight structure. It has a, it's continuously insulated really well. And it was, um, it was possible to do. It, was, it, it took some labor, but it was a, a system that we could handle. There's like, uh, this is my coworker Tomas. And we have one other guy that works with us named Ben. He's on vacation right now. He's in Montana, probably never coming back. Yeah. <laughs> but the three of us. He's my business partner. Yeah, so Ben and, ben and Tomas have a business and, the, and it's called Boreal Builders and they have cards up here. Uh, they work with me quite frequently. And so it allowed the three of us to create a system that we could physically handle because all the parts were small enough that we could personally lift them and get them up on the roof and put them together. So that was a, our, our decision to make a, a continuously insulated roof system that would work well with a heavy timbered structure. And then that system continues over the, uh, the rest of the roof, which is more conventionally framed. So, so go ahead. Um, put on with an adhesive? No, it just sits, uh, we created a box basically. When we, okay. when we sheet the walls, yeah. there's a piece, all the siding on the outside of the house is actually on strapping to give it an airspace behind the, the siding. And there's a piece at the top that's a wide, we'd ripped sheets of Advantech, which is a sheet good, and we had put that on the top part of the wall and it sticks up and makes a box that we could set all this stuff inside of. And then when we put the two by rafters over that, we were able to use 16 inch uh, SIP panel screws that come down and screw into the tops of the rafters. And that's how it's all held together. The walls, the walls have uh, dense packed cellulose. It's actually a damp spray cellulose. So the, when they install it, they have a, a truck. It's like a regular cellulose spray, but they spray water as they're spraying the cellulose and it makes it sticky and it sticks into the wall cavities. And then they come along and shave it off. And that gives, the nice thing about the damp spray cellulose is it gives them, every, all the wall cavities are completely open. And so they can see what they're doing and what they're insulating. And then they, um, can, can make sure it you know, has the right density that they want. So, uh, what's yeah. the difference between the other kind of cellulose where they're spraying into the contained? Okay, so there's, there's kind of three different ways that they install cellulose. One is uh, the damp spray, which is what this house used. And that, uh, that's where you add water to the cellulose as you're spraying it so that it sticks to like a spit wad. And uh, that's one method. The other method would be you would uh, a few years ago when I would do this, they would, we would put the sheetrock on and, and we would have all the sheathing and the sheetrock on and then we would drill holes in the sheetrock and they would spray or they'd drill holes on the outside depending on how you wanted to install it and they would, they would pump the cellulose in and they would pressurize it to like three and a half pounds per square inch and they'd try to, um, they would try to pressurize it, but what would happen is the sheetrock would actually start to blow off the wall. If you had a piece that you didn't screw down really well, it would actually, if the guy overpressurized it, it would start to pop things off. Um, so that's a dense pack. And now they do a lot of dense pack where they actually staple a screen on. And so the, the beauty of the screen is, as you're filling it, the air can escape because you're, you're filling a, a closed cavity. So you need the air that's in there to come out. And so the, the air can escape and they can uh, make sure, you know, they can feel how dense it is and they can calculate how many bales they used and for the amount of space that they're filling and, and hit their target for how much insulation density they want. Because uh, the goal is to try to make it so that it's not going to settle, uh, which is one of the problems with cellulose in the past, I think. And then the third method for cellulose is, which, uh, which they did use in the attic of the um, breezeway over here, or the entryway, is just to 
spray loose cellulose in over the, over the ceiling joist until you get a certain depth and at that depth it'll settle over time but even with the settling they calculate how much insulation value you get. So is there an advantage to just doing the wet kind? Um, not particularly. Actually the wet kind can be somewhat of a disadvantage in a way because it, it produces a lot of moisture in the, in the building and in a building this tight that much moisture has to go somewhere. So we actually had to ventilate by opening the windows a little bit for quite a bit of the winter in order to get yeah, in order to get the, uh, the house to allow it to dry out. This wall system is based on um, you, uh, your, all your walls have to have a way to dry out. And so in this particular wall assembly, the foam and the sheathing on the outside doesn't allow moisture to go through hardly at all. And so this wall system has a cycle every year where it, it'll get a little bit damp inside the wall. Cellulose is an excellent material for soaking up a little bit of moisture and um, holding it for a, slu a short period of time and then it gives it back up the, over, the, over the drier parts of the summer. So, um, or actually, yeah, because it's in the winter where you would create the moisture inside. Yeah, inside your, your space. Um, so this wall doesn't have anything besides sheetrock, uh, except for the, the two wall end walls here. They have, they have some structural sheathing on the inside, which is permeable enough for the cellulose to dry. But I, th I bet you if we opened up one of these walls, it would still be damp somewhat in some, in some of the cellulose. No, there's uh, this, this particular, it, it could be if you, um, like I've built timber frames before and had them fairly tight and the moisture will start to cause mold in the, in the building um, before it all dries out a little bit. But in this case, um, because we were ventilating the, ho the house, it helped dry it while we were working on it. So, yeah. Could you say a little bit about the windows? Oh yeah, the windows are Lowen um, from uh, White River Junction. It's called uh, Lowen Windows and Doors. Um, they, they are triple glazed, so they have a high performance value. And they're all casement windows, which allow the window to seal really well around, the, around a gasket. So the windows all seal very well. Um, they're really heavy. <laughs> Actually, Tomas and I put in all the windows together without Ben, because Ben was, uh, was he on vacation? Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Anyway. So is that south end? That's, that's actually east. Um, this house doesn't have very many, much uh, glazing toward the south. There's a couple windows in the bedroom and the entryway. But. So would you have put... Uh, with triple glaze windows facing east, uh, were you concerned about too much heat coming in or not? Um, not really, because in this case, most likely a lot of the windows are a low solar heat gain. So they, um, it's, you especially have to be careful with windows like on the west side for at the late part of the day in the summertime, the sun will just be blasting in and heating up your house right in the summer when you don't really want it to. So. Um, a lot of these wind higher performance windows, they'll put, a, they'll put a glazing on them that allows them to reflect some of the solar energy. Which, if you're, if you're my age or older, you probably wonder about solar, you know, passive solar design. And a lot of the houses now are actually trying to make a tight envelope, they're trying to insulate well, and they're not as worried about solar design because that's always a tricky thing to plan for. You know, some, you're, you're going to get blasted with too much sun at some point. And it's easier to just have a really well insulated house and, and plan that instead of trying to shade yourself from too much sun. So the, the thinking's changed a little bit. Were you suggesting they were made in White River Junction? Or they just no, this is a, it's a Canadian company. And, and uh, so they got the dealers in White River Junction. Yeah. Getting back to the moisture aspect on uh, Another energy efficient house that we did with Dylan Kinsey, um, he was saying it's too dry in his house. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. his house is not as airtight as this one. So uh, he was finding he had to add moisture, hang clothes uh, in the house and so forth. Um, so even though some of the uh, insulation might be wet 
cellulose, it's going to dry out pretty quickly. With the dry out stages. Let's see that heat recovery ventilator. Because the heat recovery ventilator does exchange heat, but it doesn't exchange moisture. So in the winter time, the air outside is much drier than the inside air. And when it comes into the warm air, it becomes even drier. Um, so in some cases, it might make sense to have what's called an energy recovery ventilator, which works the same way, but in addition to the heat exchange, it also exchanges moisture with the air pad. They're that definitely common in, in places where there's cooling loads. Mm -hmm. um, and we're starting to find that maybe it makes sense here in our climate too. Yes. This house, um, I asked the insulator what his opinion was about it, and he said that uh, he thought that this house would be better off with a heat recovery ventilator, which does it, which loses some of the moisture. And I'm trying to remember why he said that, and I'll have to think about that for a minute. But the house next door, for Dan's standing right there, he's um, they have an energy recovery ventilator, which which keeps some of the moisture in the house. And we did that, I think, on your house because you were. Uh, some of our experiences were that the houses were too dry. And, yeah. Oh, I remember why. <laughs> this house is so tight that you you almost uh, you almost want to you want to be able to get rid of the moisture. That's one of the really important things about a house to be healthy. You need to have it at a certain level of moisture in order to not start growing mold and having you know condensation on windows and things like that. So. Um, in a house this tight, a heat recovery ventilator is probably fine because you, you, you'll generate some moisture in the air, but you're probably going to want to try to get rid of it more than not. And so that's one of the... And then the other thing I'd say about it is um, a lot of times you can put in a heat recovery ventilator and then if you find that you're getting too dried out later on, you can swap the core on some of the units and, and turn it into an, an energy recovery ventilator. So there's, it's not a, a, a final trip. At least for some brands. So, can you talk about the heat? Um, uh, you have both electric baseboard heat that's oh, for yeah. the backup, and then the uh, yeah. Uh, heat pump. Okay. Uh, did, Stu, did you have something that oh, well, about the heat recovery? The energy recovery uh, doesn't involve plumbing. It's just taking the moisture that was going to go outside and it, it inside. It does involve a little bit of plumbing. Um, there's. Uh, those, so that some, sometimes uh, they'll have condensation. They need, they need to get rid of some condensation sometimes. And, and so there's a, there's a drain that's plumb. Right, yeah. Um, so the, let's see, we're, we're going on to uh, heating. Okay, so this house originally was gonna be all electric, all electric baseboard and that's a hundred percent efficient, which is great, but one of the problems with electric heat is uh, when, you t when you turn on the electric heat, everyone else in Vermont's turning on their electric heat, and it's cloudy a lot here. So even if they have a solar array like that house, which is lovely, you can't, you, uh, enough people turn on those electric uh, baseboard heaters, then all of a sudden you need another power plant to fire them all up at that peak load. And so that gets to be kind of a problem. So Efficiency Vermont and the, and the Vermont Energy Code actually doesn't want you to do that now. And so this house has a uh, electric baseboard heat setup that's almost big enough to c completely heat it by electric baseboard. But the thing that we did to kind of offset that was we put in a, a three, three head mini split heat pump, which is a much better way to heat than uh, electric baseboard in a way because it's more than 100% efficient. <laughs> so it turns out it's a lot more efficient to pull heat from the air, even if the air is zero degrees, and pump it into your house than it is to create new heat by burning coal and, and having an electric resistance load. So the electric uh, baseboard in this house was just under the wire as far as the energy code goes. Jen was we were kind of going back and forth about it a little bit because uh, as of 2019, you cannot design a house this way where you have all the heating capacity can be done with electric. Uh, it has to be some kind of a heat, mini, a mini split heat pump or some other form. So, yeah, yeah, so 
which it's a it's an efficient way to heat but a lot of people were kind of you know you build a really efficient house and you're like well i'll just make it all electric because the the air quality will be really good inside a house that's all electric because you're not burning propane uh, and then you then you can have all electric heat and and so when you start to add all those up it, it creates a lot more electric load for the electric company and the goal is to stop making as many electric uh, power plants as we, we want to kind of keep them the same or reduce them over time so that's the, that's the goal and so these folks decided to get a mini split heat pump which works really well it's it has heads up on the wall here um, there's one here there's one in the master bedroom and there's one down in the basement and the bad part about it was uh, the the actual device that's mounted on the wall outside and when we get done we can maybe walk around the house and you can look and see what it is it, it actually was mounted on the wall of the house and the contractor that talked us into that had a lot of really good reasons for that it's up out of the snow it um, doesn't have rodents making a nest in the in the assembly because it's got all these heating coils and fans um, it's on a it's in an area where you can't see it because it does make a little noise and it's not that fun to look at but the problem was it sounded like a truck was pulling up all the time you know like UPS is pulling up every every hour of the day when that thing was running and so we actually took it off the building and made a stand for it and so if you ever do a heat pump I would strongly advise you not to mount it on the building because that was a big mistake yeah yes That's true. They, they this winter, if they were on, or? Um, this particular one, we didn't we didn't have the electric resistance heat until like a couple, you know, a few weeks ago, I guess. So we didn't even use that. Um, we just used the mini split heat pump, and it worked great at all, the whole winter, even in the construction phase where we had you know the door open a lot and stuff like that. So it they do have troubles like I think they get down to 17 or 20 below or something like that. They start to yeah. It, Yeah. I mean, when you get as it gets colder, they're not producing as much heat. Um, but usually they're sized so that they provide most heat. And we're we're encouraging these in homes like this that are really well insulated air seals, so that if it does get cool for a certain period of time, and the heat output of these drops, that the house can still maintain most of the heat. And, mm -hmm. Um, sometimes we'll see two or three degrees temperature drop on really cold days when the systems aren't performing at full capacity. Um, but for the most part, they seem to be doing okay. The trick is make sure you get a cold climate heat pump. Um, the Efficiency Vermont has a list of those type of units. We wouldn't recommend installing anything other than a cold climate heat pump. Unless you're just looking for cooling. Yeah, that's the other reason they just, one, one thing that, I was trying to talk them into getting a, a heat pump, but the thing that really pushed them over the, the edge and said, okay, we're going to put one in, was we had that period of hot weather last summer, and they were up visiting during that time, and so they, they got pretty uncomfortable, and, and Dan's house over, over here has a huge amount of thermal mass, so it, it's, if it's cool, it stays cool for a long, long time. But it started to, you know, we had heat that was over a week long, and it started to lose a little ground. And it, we're in the guest room upstairs, and yeah. the face is west, and they just, in those sunny summer days, it got too hot for them. So, uh oh, we gotta yeah. this house a little bit in the summer. And they, they actually live in the wintertime in Florida. That's one reason why we have all this electric baseboard heating. Just my father in law was concerned that if they come up in the winter, they want the house to be warm right away. Uh, and so, Pretty much, that's the reason for all that is that they want to turn it on in a couple hours later, yeah. being a nice warm house. Yeah. So they invest a lot in the baseboard. They're probably off for a long rest of the year. Right. Yeah. That's. It's not something that. It's. It's kind of a backup heat. Um, it might be nice in the in the entryway because the entryway stay, with the door shut, it stays a little cooler. So you know maybe they'd want to warm up that. Yeah. I was curious what this cost. The three three head, and they're all connected to the one. Um, yeah, I knew you were going to ask that question, but I was not able to get the price of the heat pump. I had uh, one contractor uh, gave us a quote that was sixteen thousand dollars, and that that we didn't hire that guy obviously because it was a, a very high quote. I I would guess this was anywhere from I, I would say around ten 
to eight to ten maybe, but I I couldn't find the paperwork for that. So um, is that installed? Or? That's installed. Yeah, I think in Dylan's place and and some of the other houses we looked at, they had a single head heat pump, and it was a much you know much more reasonable yeah, those price. Were like five or six thousand, but you only had one condenser unit and one yeah. unit, inside unit. And it's it's very possible that in this house they could have gone with a smaller unit like if you heat at the lowest level with one of those heads it might have been fine I don't know so they uh, like they have one in the bedroom because they definitely didn't want the bedroom to be chilly or something you know I mean it depends on the configuration of the house whether mm -hmm. you can um, you know just get one if right if it's all open that's one thing yeah so. I just talked with uh, another contractor who's building his own house here in Crashbury and uh, that's a very small house, I don't know, maybe a uh, thousand square feet or so. Uh, and uh, he put two of them in because the apartment downstairs by itself. And uh, he worked with uh, a plum, plumber heater, uh, $5,000 for both of them. So okay. they can be uh, had at an inexpensive price. Mm -hmm. What was the thought process behind the idea of the old stove? Uh, they they just decided that they would really love to have a wood stove, and the the next door house has the same. It's the same model that they're going to put in. Yeah. What is it? Yeah. Well, the other. Yeah, I was going to say the other thing that kind of fell into that decision was, you know, once in a while here we have like a ice storm that's you know you lose your power for a week, and so what are you going to do? And. Uh, so I think they were worried that you know maybe it would be a good way of backup heat. Uh, I think they're going to use their stove less than you do by far. Yeah. You know, it's more. It'll be more for uh, comfort. You know, occasionally and yeah. So is there a, a dedicated air supply installers that just get it through the HRV? No, there's there's a, a direct vent that'll be piped right into the back of the stove. So it's it's, it's never been clear to me how that. Effect, I mean, if you've got. A structure that's really tight, mm -hmm. um, you know, 0 0.08, whatever the, the air infiltration is. Then you, you know, you you uh, get this great big huge hole, adding you know to this, this stack effect to this big thing. Yeah. Does that? Does how much does that just negate the whole benefit of the air tightness? Uh, it's a good question because I think um, we've talked about this in the last few energy tours. Uh, probably, probably the advice would be in a really a really tight, super energy efficient house, you might not want to have a, a wood stove. Yeah. Dylan, Dylan Kinsey's house that we were at, he chose not to have a wood stove for, you know, partly for that reason, that I think. Be, yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it's funny, the past house people always talk about, uh, they're going to have a backup wood stove, but if you ask them how that can actually work, no one has any idea. Yeah. yeah. You know how it works is they crack the window. Yeah, you right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, but, that's what but, most of them do. But the thing is, when, when the even when the window is closed, the, the stove is still there. You got this big stack. Uh, it's not you, that bad of a um, effect, actually. Because it's this, not. Yeah. Yeah, it, 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 there's a house over in Norwich that was passive house, so we're going for passive house, and we probably would have earned it if they followed through. They had a wood stove, and I did the blower door test on it. And, um, we found that it was maybe 0.1 mm. ACH 50 higher than when they had done pre wood stove. Mm. Uh -huh. So really, uh, if you seal everything up well and get a good wood stove, it actually isn't as bad as uh -huh. we presume it to be. But so when you do when you do the blower door test, uh, presuming you got the stove installed, you got the you got the. Um, the dampers are closed and everything, so it's, it's pulling whatever air is pulling through, yep. down the flue and through the, the stove door. So yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Then the makeup air, I yeah. presume, is, yep. so it's not pulling from. Right, the makeup air, yeah. Right. Air now, the, one, of the, one of the houses, yeah, you, you can, that's actually been one of their events for the winter was that, that hole there and the, and the chimney itself. Uh, one, of the, one of the houses that we did, at, Caleb Craven, um, one of his houses that we did on the energy tour, his mother's place had a wood stove in it. And he actually had some uh, extra dampers that he put in to cut off the, the outdoor air supply and stuff like that when she wasn't using it. Um, we're not going to do that in this house. It's just, it's going to be that. Yeah. It's something we recommend, mm -hmm. but it, it depends on the homeowner. Sure. The homeowner is 
mean, they'll find out some nuts that they yeah. forgot to eat. Yeah. But yeah. then, well, they're not going to close it, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, how about other uh, okay. uh, holes to the, your thermal envelope, uh, like the oh. bathroom fans, yeah. and what do you do to uh, uh, keep oh. it from backdrafting? Do you have a special yeah. technique? Let's see. So there's these funny, um, there's these funny mushroom sort of things on the outside that you'll see. These are these are vents that are for there's a there's one for the dryer, and then there's two that are for the bathroom fans. And the only difference is, uh, you it's the same vent for all three occasions, but uh, a dryer has a much more much more airflow than a bathroom fan. So in order to use them on the bathroom fan, there's another little kit that you put in, which is basically just a spring. So the way these seal is, they have a a chamber with a cup over it, and as the dryer vent, you know, as the dryer is venting, the cup floats and lets the air out. So the bathroom one has the spring on top that sort of helps it lift the weight a little bit easier. And these are these are a good vent system for bathroom and and dryer vents to keep the house pretty tight when it's not uh, when you're not using those items. Um, so that was one thing we decided to do was to try to up the performance of our, our venting a little bit. Another th passively sealing vents. Yeah. Or like passively opening. Right. Um, so they only open when they when the air's airflow. And otherwise there's there's it's it's not a you know it's like super tight seal. It's just something sitting on something else. But it is con you know a, a circle that's continuously touching. Um, uh, these are made by, I think they're called Heartland, uh, let's see, yeah, Heartland Products. It's kind of a funny name for a, when you look them up on the online. The name of that kind of vent is called a... It's just a dryer vent, you know. Positive closure. Yeah. So, Jen, Jen sent me some uh, different literature, you know, a different, couple different companies to, to look at. There's uh, another company, I can't remember the name of that one, it's called... Uh, yeah. There's a, there's a couple on there's a couple on the online that you'll run into that have a similar sort of shape and this is the one that gets the most positive reviews and seems like uh, people like it the most so we went with that one. Uh, they come You can do it with a house that's already been built, yeah. Uh, they fit pretty much into the same scenario that a regular dryer vent would. Uh, they're they're just a little better build. Uh, they have like you know a dryer vent from the hardware store is kind of cheesy in a way. And then the these come they're white and that was kind of a downside. I I wanted to get a different color but, but I was able to spray paint them to to look what colors she might want. So there's one sitting right outside here. Yeah. There's another one on the back side of the house here. Uh, another thing that we did and I can pass this around or you can come up and look at it when you're when you're looking at things. This is called the uh, sure seal. One of one of the problems with a super tight house like this is um, down in the basement we have a floor drain and the floor drain drains out to the outside just to daylight and all winter long there was like a pretty good draft coming up that floor drain and it will be like that forever if you don't fill it with water. Uh, it's just got a bell trap so that's it's got a a big chamber that fills up with water and then uh, keeps the thing sealed but the problem is um, unless you're adding water to that system, it'll dry up and then there's then the air just comes right through. So there's a, a product that we found called, it's made by a company called Rector Seal and it's uh, Sure Seal is the name of the device and all it is is it's a plug that fits perfectly into the drain inside and it's got a little spring-loaded flap and so if enough water pours into there it'll actually open up and let the water out and if, and if it's um, not in use, then the flaps tight and the air can't come in, and so it keeps out bugs or uh, air. So snakes, yep. Have you had snakes in your uh, <laughs> basement drain? Yeah. So it keeps out uh, undesirable things and and seals it up a little better. So we tried that on this house to see how it would work, and it was it was about forty bucks. I ordered it through Ace Hardware online, and it just came in this little package, and I just popped it in there one day, and and that, and I haven't felt any air coming through ever since. So, um, that, the yeah. dryer vent, was that installed when you did the blower door test? No, uh, we blocked all those up so that because, because the, the, we haven't done the final blower door test that Efficiency Vermont does. So in our case, we just did 
the blower door that they used for the AeroSeal process. And so he's mostly focusing on the gaps and cracks that, he, that he's chasing down and not the holes that we want to create in the building. So the bathroom fans were sealed? Or they were sealed. Yeah, the ductwork was there, but I had uh, like 3M tape over them so that they wouldn't, because we didn't want to clog up the bath fan with, with uh, sticky stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I noticed you, the house was designed by a Florida architect. Is that? Uh, she's from Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Yeah. Okay. I guess I was wondering if you had any, like, just in working with the architect, like, you know, then it seems like it sounds like you made a lot of changes mm -hmm. during the process. And I'm, I'm sort of wondering, from your point of view, what would you have done differently from the beginning as far as designing the house, or what challenges did you have working mm -hmm. with an architect that maybe isn't used to designing a house quite this way? Um, well, it's, I don't want to put all the weight on her because um, the owner had really specific ideas for what spaces she wanted, like, a lot of the design is the owner's design and the architect helped uh, d you know maybe change the roof lines a little bit and that sort of thing I think personally the biggest thing I would like to see different from this house is the roof lines with the snow the way it is here um, that's something that has been has been a little bit of a problem but the the goal is they they're probably not going to live here in the winter mostly anyway so that wasn't as important to them um, but other than that, uh, they, she was a long distance uh, partner and so I, you know, she would come up and meet occasionally and so I was able to, to uh, work with her on, that, on things that way. Um, and, and we also just went for a, a set of construction drawings so she doesn't have like the full, like she didn't tell us where every outlet and everything goes. We had some rough ideas about it. And so that, uh, the drawings kind of cut off at a certain point in the process, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Um, arrow barrier. This particular house, we got a, a whopper deal because it was his first one, and he just wanted to try it. So we were the guinea pig. Um, we, I think it was about a thousand dollars for the, or fifteen hundred for the, the deal. But if if you did this house full price, uh, the way he would sell it, it's about a dollar twenty-five a square foot. This is a 20, 2,600 square foot house, and it would be like $3,332 or something like that for him to do that process. Uh, the, the way you can justify that is if you've got the three of us like stick and tape to every surface, and the tape is expensive European tapes, you could probably get to that $3,000 pretty quick. So that's the, 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 bo the bonus, I guess, with the Aero Seal or Aero Barry. Exactly, yeah, yeah, days. Can you talk about the entryway? That was not hand sealed beforehand, right? right so that, uh, this, this part of the building, I really wish we could have done a, a blower door test just on this, side, this part of the building because we detailed it really carefully. The entry, or entryway we basically built, you know, regular, uh, it has sort of a truss system over it and we didn't seal it up at all. It's just, if you, uh, the idea for aero barrier is that you have a reasonably tight building assembly so the, your plywood sheets would be close together and, and uh, you wouldn't have any giant gaps, I guess. But, so that's the way that was detailed. And like I say, we started out at like 0.8 air changes an hour. So to give you a visual picture, we, we talk about air changes per hour and all this stuff and it's like, you might as well be talking about billions of dollars. Um, it's not something you can wrap your head around necessarily. So if you take the, uh, this, the original blower door test on this house, it was like a five and something square. Uh, if you sealed every single crack and gap and added and put it into one space, it would be like having a hole in the wall this big. And then if you did the air barrier on this house, and brought it down to the 0.08. It's about two and five sixteenths by two and five sixteenths hole in the wall. So it, it's not a giant change, really. That's why less than one air change an hour is considered high performance. And then you know this is kind of extreme, but it's it's still a hole, you know. Whereas an old farmhouse might have the you know that half of that wall's missing <laughs> all winter long, you know. So that's the difference. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's uh, quite a few fi uh, fixtures here that are built in that are floor, uh, 
that are, um, what do you call them? They're, they're, no, they're uh, LEDs. These are actually, well, those, those are. Yeah, these are, I'm curious about these because, I mean, LEDs they, last a lot longer. They were supposed to be LEDs. So the, changing those phones got kind of a pain for somebody. Yeah, well, the, the electrician isn't finished yet, and he's supposed to have LEDs in these. But I think the ones that he bought weren't dimmable, and so he's going to have to change them. So that's the re reason. Say that again. Are they arriving with bulbs? Yeah. No, the the electrician provided the bulbs just to just to give us some light. So he put the globes on yesterday, and then realized that the LED bulbs that he'd purchased aren't uh, aren't dimmable, which is right. And so that's right. So he's got to change those out. He's got he's got a fair amount of work still left to do. Yeah. So. Um, well, any other questions? Uh, we can move on to uh, another section of the house. Yeah. Go we'll see uh, down in the yeah, that, bedroom uh, basement oh. area. I should say that during the design process, originally she was going to have a whole loft area up up here, and this was going to be the main level, and then the basement was going to be this giant basement. But it's it's actually pretty nice to finish out a basement, especially if you have a walkout and you've got all that light available. Um, it's, you'll, if you go down to the basement, you'll find it's actually quite light and cheerful down there. It's not a dungeon like most of us think of as a basement. And so um, they decided to not do the loft. It's, there's an attic up there that's conditioned inside the conditioned envelope that you can get through to the uh, from one of the closets in the back bedroom here. But the entire downstairs was able to be finished that way and, and gave her quite a bit of living space that uh, was desirable for an office and he li he'll have a man cave down there and so it's it's a nice way to add space to the build. Well, what about the foundation? Is that insulated on the outside and underneath? And all that? Uh, the, actually, uh, the foundation here is a, kind of a, a little different. It's, um, it's a conventional foundation but the insulation is mostly on the inside. Um, there's a few reasons for that. One is if you ever lived with chickens that, and, you're, and you run the lawnmower into the foam on the outside, then the uh, stuff, the spackling gets cracked and then the chickens start eating your foundation. And so that's always something that I notice. So I actually prefer to have more of a concrete foundation on the outside. Um, and then this is insulated on the inside with layers of foam and like three three different layers of foam and then there's a two by four wall that's built on the inside that you can run all the wiring and everything in that's insulated with cellulose so the basement slab um, they basically went for the, the the bottom value for efficiency Vermont so they have like an R, R15 I think is the is the base value they have a little bit higher than that because I was able to sneak in some different kinds of foam um, so it's got it's got a slab and then the foam is actually over the slab and then there's a, a subfloor assembly over that with two layers of, of plywood and then uh, the finished floor is on top. And the reason that we chose to do that against the wishes of Efficiency Vermont was these folks will be coming up occasionally and they want their house to be easily warmed up from, from its base temperature wherever they leave it when they're gone. And a giant basement slab is a lot of thermal mass. And that's a, that's a lot of their living spaces down there and they didn't really want to be on a cold surface. So they decided to have it, that, that thermal mass outside the envelope. So it was a little bit of a hybrid that way. The, the entryways that way as well, it's got foam underneath the, the subfloor and the tile. And it's over a slab. Yeah. Tomas, do you want to talk about this? Oh, this is just another yeah. product being used on the, uh, the house. A lot of times when you have venting on your roof, or if you have a good rain screen that's uh, you know got venting, you need a way to close the the outlets and inlets of the air going through. So I forget exactly what this product is called. That's um, it's SV5, but it's uh, yeah, I can't remember the name of the product either. It's it's a core vent, I think, is the brand name. Okay. Yeah. Core vent, we'll call it the brand name. So what it is, it's basically a waffle type of pattern. This is pretty dense, and it's got a, a thin screen on this side, which won't allow bugs to get through. So 
on your rain screen on your exterior wall, you put this underneath and one at top to allow air to go in and out. And on the roof up here, we have put it underneath the eaves, so you have continuous air going up and no bugs to go through. What's the advantage of uh, having that airspace over just nailing it, the clapboard to the uh, underlayment like they usually have? Moisture will always get behind your clapboards. It's not, you know, having your walls, uh, having your siding, it's not going to, it's, you know, it's going to shed a lot of your water, but your vapor and other kinds of moisture will get pulled to the inside. And so having a rain screen allows that moisture to go somewhere instead of sitting and festering behind your wall if it's just attached straight to your sheathing. It'll also, when the, wind, when the wind blows, if you have a vented assembly behind your siding, the, the, when the wind blows, it actually equalizes the pressure more between the outside and the, when the driving rain's happening and the inside behind the siding. And so that keeps this, the water from being driven in and, and sucking into behind the siding. So it, it helps equalize the pressure behind a siding assembly. It also prevents you from staining or painting more often too. On the, right, on yeah, the exterior. it can. So having a rain screen is a great idea. Yeah. This, this house actually doesn't have a true rain screen on the walls. Um, it's got vertical siding, you'll notice, and it's on strapping. So there is an airspace behind it, but it's not a vented airspace. And part of the reason for that is um, the vertical boards as they're put together, they all have gaps between them. And so they're, they're, a, t they're a shiplap. So there's actually, it's not a gap like straight through that you're seeing straight through, but it does have a little bit of a pathway for air to get in and out. So we decided not to ventilate the, the uh, siding assembly. But the benefit of having the strapping is it gives you a really good nail base. You can, you can nail your siding on and the nails don't start popping out over time as the siding expands and contracts from the heat because you've got this really nice strip of wood in, underneath the siding instead of just a little thin layer of plywood, which is what a lot of buildings have. So. Are there questions? One, uh, well, before we move yeah. on, um, just want to put another plug in for our window inserts if you're interested in um, these. Uh, it's a community build project, so if you uh, want some of these put into your house, they, they do go up in on the inside and they seal it pretty tight with uh, this uh, open cell phone. And uh, the community build means that the, the owner that's buying them gets to participate in uh, putting the frames together and wrapping it with plastic and this open cell phone. So the Glover, uh, Greensboro, and Craftsbury Energy Committees will be doing that. And there's a sign-up sheet here. Mm -hmm.